The Broken Up Podcast analyzes what makes Olympic athletes, comedians, writers, and creatives great. Season one is titled Breakthroughs. This season of the pod delves into the breakthroughs we have in our respective fields when we destigmatize mental health and move past the roadblocks within our minds. Executive produced by Ellen Utrecht of Mike TV. Smrr, smash the like, subscribe, follow, you know the drill. This is the Broken Dope Podcast, and I'm your host, Danny Simmons. Today, we have the one-man thrill ride. He's a professional wrestler, better known by his ring name, Jimmy Preston. He is best known for his work with the NEW, Northeast Wrestling. You've heard of it. Jimmy Preston, aka the one-man thrill ride. Jimmy is an absolute savage. He's an independent pro wrestler, former D3 baseball superhero, and an absolute savage. You may know him from the pre-alumni viral video where he's in the parking lot hammering a bacon egg and she hold the she <laughs> uh, take a look at the clip here uh, we have the one man thrilly dilly here on the pod thanks for coming on thrill ride come on thank you brother it's good to see you thanks for having me i'm excited to talk today so right looking forward so, to it so you you know tell me you've obviously you've written a feature film on your life of the thrill ride you have a, a quite a story. I want to hear about it. You, you're 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 delving into mental health. You have a comedic perspective on this. I want to hear a little bit about what the movie's about and and the the reach that you want to get with this. Yeah. So you know, people ask me, you know, why I even want to do a movie? It's like or make it about yourself. You know what I mean? You know, it's just it's not. It's a fictional story, but I guess it's kind of inspired by kind of the lessons I've learned in my life. And it's you know the pre purpose behind it is I wanted to kind of raise awareness to mental health. Um, in a certain way that makes people laugh and doesn't make people feel uncomfortable. There's kind of a stigma with it. And, you know, it kind of was paralleling my real life as it was happening when I was dealing with some stuff. And, but I, you know, wouldn't it be funny to see the one man thrill ride character go through therapy when like Jim actually was and, um, you know, dealing with like, you know, the ups and downs of life and stuff and uh, doing it in a rated R comedy where there's no real on, on the surface, there's no hugging or learning, but you know, it, there's an underlying message to the film. So that's what we're working on and I'm excited about it. So. And what's that? So what's that like going through therapy? I mean, obviously your, your persona, your character has so much bravado and confidence. What's that like kind of conquering that, you know, in, in therapy for you? You know, my, my problem was always like depression. I kind of struggled. I, I basically learned, I, I struggled with it when I played college baseball. I had a head coach who was a great mentor and, you know, he always, I just remember the meetings with him. He's like, dude, you have the best, you have the best mechanics in the conference. It's like, you need to shrink, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and he's like, serious. And I'd laugh and he's like, no, seriously, my, my wife's a PhD and like, she would love to talk to you. But like, I never really like handled it appropriately until I was about 35. So um, it is what it is. It's one of those deals like talk therapy. It's like, it's good at first if you have a pattern of behavior um, yeah. that, you know, is causing problems in your life. But overall, I think if you're depressed, it can turn into you just kind of focus on the problems. Um, so I like it initially. And then over time, I think the way to get out of depression is just have a, the right mindset, you know, love yourself, um, have some self-compassion and like just have a goal and a dream and a focus and a purpose every day. And that's where you, that's how you come out of it. You know? So. I gotta be honest. I'm like, I'm still, I, I, I think I'm doing a similar thing. I'm depressed right now where I'm like going, I wake up and I'm like, fuck emotional. And then, and then it's, it's a wave. It's a roller coaster, right? Like sometimes it's just, it hits for a second. And then you know you wake up and you're crying. You're like, what the hell is this? Why, why am I crying? I woke up this morning. I'm like crying. And then now I'm in a great mood, just like a total roller coaster of everything. And, but you're right. The goals, that's one of the things I getting out of sport, you know, it sucks, right? Yeah. You don't get, you don't have this routine. And I, I wasn't really depressed when I was playing, but now I'm, I think I maybe had anxiety for sure. I was like right. ruminating in the future. And I uh, actually, my catcher, Kellen Lee is now working for the giants as a mental, he got his PhD in, in as a, in psychology. Now he's a mental strength uh, coach. Yeah. And I wish, I wish I had him telling me yeah. what to do when, you yeah, know, I wish he had that PhD when I, where I was in college, I'd be a different guy. Cause there's something I was kind of similar as a player. It's funny you mentioned that. Yeah. Like I always like did better. Like when the stakes were higher, cause like, I just put so much pressure on myself, <laughs> like in a regular game that like a playoff <laughs> game, it was like, oh, I always had this much pressure on myself. So. <laughs> yeah. Like, Some other guys I... get the yips. I would, whatever. I was fine. So 
but yeah. yeah. So, so you've also said, you know, never train with the focus of being better than the scrawny suck bag next to you. Never look down on the normie bat bathing in mediocrity, living at 32% of his genetic potential. Instead, focus on being the be very best you can be day in and day out and reach your genetic potential. That's what it means to be a savage, an absolute savage. In 2021, how are you unleashing the absolute savage within? Thrill ride. Come on. I mean, I wrote, I, I think it's the film. I wrote a film about, yeah. you know, what I've learned in my life and everything like that. And, you know, the through eyed character is like comedic inspiration. That's that sort of how we, that's sort of how the, the, the movie rolls. So like, that's kind of what I've been focused on. I'm, I'm getting back in a good shape. Uh, I'm focused on being a good father. And I think um, over the last year, I really took a, a real focus on like my, you know, emotional health and, you know, well being and, and my mental health, because I realized, you know, that's actually more important than what you accomplish in your career for me to be like, you know, my, the purpose of my life is to be a good father. So, you know, to me, that's more important. Being emotionally and mentally healthy and strong for him is more important than loading up his college fund with a bunch of money. So I've really focused on that. And I think that in, that, in that's own way, that's kind of uh, kind of an absolute savage approach, I think. To kind of but you're also you're also going to load up that college fund. Come on, we could we can tell it. <laughs> that's, like, that's hopefully the uh, you got I got big dreams. So yeah, hopefully <laughs> it's come it's come. Hey, you know we can always, you can always go CC to freaking state. It doesn't matter. It, no matter yeah. what happens, you got time, right? Yeah. How, how old's how old's your son? He's three. So yeah, come on. You're already oh, yeah. so you're already thinking ahead. That's great. You have 15 years. Come on, baby. Um. So what inspired? So obviously baseball. You know, I love the game. Still obsessed. Yeah. I wish I could play. I don't. I don't watch it as much as I used to. Same. It's hard to watch when you're not in it. Yeah. Um, what inspired you? Obviously, you know, you have baseball, football. You were kind of you played a lot of sports. What inspired you to get into wrestling, like professional wrestling? I was just a huge fan growing up, and um, I, I just was drawn to the larger than life characters. You know what I mean? Um, and my dad was like a weightlifter. I think I kind of looked up to him. And he got me into lifting weights when I was like 13. So I was like like the wrestlers who were like jacked and cocky and handsome and said like ridiculous stuff that was actually really funny. Um, so that's sort of like, I knew I wanted to be a wrestler from a very young age. I was about nine years old. I told my dad that's and actually in my movie, that's like the only scene that's like kind of based on my real life. It was like October 30th, 1993. I'm like a really funny <laughs> flashback scene, but um, awesome. it's like the moment I realized I want to be a pro wrestler. But anyway, um, so like I was into the rock and stuff and I knew that the rock would, you know, I watched a lot of documentaries on him and like he wrote his own stuff. So like he had 28 pages or hundred pages of his own lines. So I started doing that and I like invented this character, the one man thrill ride, which was like this womanizing thing. And his name was a double entendre about like getting laid. You know what I mean? Like, like he's this <laughs> cocky jock, like douche kind of character. And um, like, I, I got that from like just being a huge wrestling fan. I was drawn to the, like the larger than life alpha male personality i just thought it was funny so and and so like obviously you know you have this alpha you have this you're part alpha but also kind of you're more sensitive now you've kind of have you been broke have you been broken down or is it just this is always who you are <laughs> yeah it's a good yeah. question um yeah a little bit of broken down but like i think you just get older kids humble you like i have a three-year-old it's like you think you're gonna do this and that as a dad and then like he just decides to walk all over you one day and it's just like it's kind of humbling <laughs> You know, you still you know, do your best to be the best dad you can be, but you know, yeah, life kind of breaks you down. I had, you know, for me, I, when I didn't make it to WWE, I, my story was I had, you know, I created an online persona. I was kind of older when I started, I was like in my late twenties, this one man throw ride thing started. It really is what gave me my self-confidence uh, in my late twenties um, and really believe in myself. And then like when it didn't work out, it kind of, that kind of broke me and started like a, uh, like a three to five year, like slide where like until last year I got, you know, I really got clinically depressed for uh, a good period of time. And I actually decided to like do something about it. I was like, I got a kid, I get, you know, I got to be responsible. I owe it to myself. That's the thing with mental health is, you know, it's a very real thing and it causes damage in your life, but you owe it yourself. You, you're responsible for making it right and you can make it right. So. And you said, so you almost, you almost made it in, in the WWE. Do you want to talk about that moment? Like, was there a, a tryout or a trial? How does that yeah. work? Yeah, it was, it was a three-day tryout. It was like in June in 2015, and like obviously, like I'm writing a movie. Like I, I don't, I don't want to be a pro wrestler anymore. So like I'm okay talking about it. Because, but like you get blackballed talking about getting invited for a tryout because it's not, it's not a huge deal. 
because they get it. They'll invite somebody who's like a division one, all American out of like Minnesota. who's a great athlete, but he's not even a wrestling fan, but he just gets a tryout because of a certain look and he knew somebody. Yeah. So I got there because of my online presence in my videos, I was told, you know, and I thought, I really thought I had some magic at the time I was being featured on Barstool a lot. Like when Barstool was local, it was Boston Barstool. And it was like really getting hot. Um, so like I was actually drawing fans and, you know, and I wrestled with all the guys who got signed from new England. And at a t- point in time, I was more popular than all of them. You know what I mean? It was like, I yeah. was the slam dunk to get signed. And I was the one guy who actually didn't. And I took it really, really hard. And, uh, the moment it happened, I was like at work, I was working I was an enterprise sales rep and look, look, looking back at it, I, I didn't handle it rationally. Um, but like, I really let it like emotionally break me down and like doubt myself. And I lost my confidence. I think after that, um, when it wasn't even rational, I was right there on the one yard line. I could have kept going and I probably should have, but, um, it was just the way I'm wired. I, like, I, you know, I didn't know enough about myself on yet. I think, I think I figured that out in my mid thirties. <laughs> so, so you, <laughs> so you did, so you were super close. You were, you were at the one yard line and then yeah. you didn't make that one try. And then did you stop training? Did you stop doing, yeah. you know, performing? You just, you kind of, you had a deep depression. Yeah. Yeah. And I masked it with alcohol. Like, at, you know, at that time I was like getting serious with my now ex-wife. Well, we have a great relationship. We're like great friends. Uh, we co-parent. It's, it's awesome. But, um, you know, she was there. I gained a lot of weight and I, I drank a lot of alcohol. And like, I make jokes about it in my videos. Like there's a video that went viral of me doing smash and smoke with me wearing a bronze jersey, but I'm like fat as hell. And like, <laughs> I, you know, people are like, you know, six months prior, I was at the WWE Performance Center, like 197 pounds with like veins popping out of a six pack. Like, how does that <laughs> happen in six months? It's like, you're dealing with something up here, you know? Yeah. And, um, but my wife at the time was there for me and like, I wanted to have a kid. So it was like, you know, it ended up like, uh, you know, I realized I thought I didn't want it and it was a kind of a mistake in the moment I should have kept pushing, but yeah, but that's a life lesson I've learned. And like part of writing this movie was like coming to closure with that through the way the plot is and stuff. So, yeah. I mean, it's an interesting thing, right? You know, we, we get really close and then that's like almost the biggest test. Right. Yeah. And, and also, you know, who knows? I mean, this wrestling, some of these guys go really late in their careers. You never know. Right. Right. You might get picked up. I don't, I don't know how this, I don't, I don't know the game. I obviously watched a ton when, you know, when I was a kid, I loved, you know, watching Monday night raw and all that stuff, but I definitely, can you smell it? Who doesn't love the rock? Come on. But I, I, it's never over. You know, no, it know. isn't. I mean, for me, it just kind of got to the point where it's like, I'll be, you know, I'm 36. So it's like I starting a career, like I, I work for Northeast Wrestling. I take, I, I'm on 12 shows a year. My body doesn't take that type of beating. I don't know if I want to start taking that type of beating for 10 years, just at mm-hmm. this age when my son's going to be growing up. That's the only thing that's kind of stopping me from going all in on wrestling anymore. You know what I mean? And that's why I thought the movie was kind of a better idea. But um, you never say never. Like, you know, I loved wrestling. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, it's a thrill. It gets me, keeps me in shape. I hang out with my friends. So it's, it, it's great. What's your, what's your main move? What's your signature? I do like a move? fireman's carry power bomb off the, uh, off my shoulders. So like I do that. I used to do like, I don't, so like, as I got older, you know, I became more of a kind of a gimmick wrestler. So a lot of Gaga, a lot of I do my catchphrase and dancing. And <laughs> like when I was like trying to get signed, like I was, my, I wrestled much more athletic, like top rope Frankenstein or missile drop kick. Like I did, did some athletic stuff, but you know, as I got older, it's like, I can get the same reaction strutting and getting a chant going. It's like, why would I yeah. do that? Like, <laughs> you know, why not? Why enough. Like, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. You don't need to jump 20 feet in the air. You're like, maybe I'll just do the, the, yeah, right. get the thing. Make me so, a bad guy. It was kick and punch. It's, it's great. Like, talk, talk, <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I like doing, but so, you, you know, you, uh, you talked a little bit about how you, your, your dad was a, a weightlifter. You know, you started your obsession with weightlifting at 13 uh, under the guidance of your father. You know, yeah. uh, what's your ra- relationship like today? He's the best grandfather in the world. He's an amazing guy. He's a great friend of mine. And that's another thing with the film. Like there's a, there's like a, a storyline that's like basically my relationship with my father. And that's sort of how we peel back like modern masculinity and like what it is. Right. It's a one man throw ride characters, obviously it's over the top alpha male character. And there's some characteristics about that that like I actually think are good. Uh, but when it goes too far, it can cause some real problems in your life. And, you know, just the way men were raised, I think back, back in the day, is just a lot different than they are now. So it's just kind of like pulling back, like my dad was like 
unintentionally hilarious. Like I don't like giving stories because he doesn't like it. He gets uncomfortable when I tell him. But like he's kind <laughs> of a legend, like wicked intense guy. He was like a young dad, um, you know, little league coach, coach all the way growing up, and super intense guy. He was real hard on me, but not anyone else. But yeah. um, great guy, and um, you know, so looking at that through a comedic lens in the movie is actually like really funny. But like, you know, and I thought it was important for like for guys who like former athletes, like to, to kind of think and like who are now dads to think about how, how to raise a kid and like how to handle it. So they grow up, you know, mentally tough, physically tough, but also like emotionally tough too. Was there anything? So, you know, this, this term, this catchphrase that everyone wants to talk about toxic masculinity, was there yeah. any, was there any, the, anything there with your, your father or was it more just like a, a great parenting experience? I, I know that with, with my dad, I, um, I don't think it was toxic. It was just, it was just different. Tough love. I mean, I think yeah. it sounds like there's a lot of, come on, you got to be better. And really, you know, he was pretty grab, tough on me. Grab your nuts, you know, like, <laughs> and like, I got a rated R comedy, like the one of the over and over it's don't be a, a wussy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. That was like the mantra. It's like, don't grab, you know, don't be a wuss, you know? And, uh, <laughs> but at times in life, you got to kind of, as a man, you know, you need to be able to process things in like a rational way. Um, so you need to be a little softer in certain instances, especially like now that I have a toddler and I see that it can't just be like a jerk all the time to him. So it's, you gotta be more three-dimensional than that. Like I, I read this book, uh, the mass of masculinity by Lewis Howe. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but like yeah. basically talks about like, that's like, I don't like the term toxic masculinity because it, it paints masculinity. I think like as a bad thing, like I think it's good yeah. for men to have strong and be strong and have principles and, you know, protect the women and children. Like I, I'm all for that. Um, I just think sometimes it can go too far, like with the alpha stuff and like that, the character, the one man thrill ride is like so over the top that like, it's both funny and can like teach a life lesson. I think so. No, I, I, I want to read it. I want to, I mean, obviously I'm more, I want to see it on, yeah, on the big I, screen. I, 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 I don't want to talk about how the sausage was made. I want to I, produce I, the sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so at Fitchburg State, you were a two-year captain, uh, two-time MVP, two-time all-conference selection. Uh, what do you say, you know, in, in your, you know, your career took your game to the next level and what was that? your mental approach? Was it something yeah. your coach said? Yeah, no, I, I really started to figure out like what my issues were and it was all mental when it came to hitting, like I, I struggled my, you know, I had a really good high school career and I was, I was kind of brainwashed that like, why are you going D3? And if you're going D3, why are you going to Fitchburg state? Like, what, like, what are you doing? Um, try to walk on to a D1 program, maybe this and that. But like, I had a good car. I had a good relationship with my Legion coach who was, uh, his name yeah. is Billy Travers. He was a all-star for the Milwaukee Brewers in the late seventies. And, you know, he leveled with me. He's like, he goes, you're too short to play first base and you're too slow and don't have a strong enough arm to be an outfielder and get paid to do it. He goes, you'll be <laughs> a good division three, division two player. Like you'll have a great career. He goes, that's sort of, he goes, you know, he battled me with me and I kind of was like, yeah, I'll, I'll play D3. But um, <laughs> isn't that brutal when they just tell you like it's not going to happen? He's like you. Just, he's like you're a good ball player. He's like you're just not a good enough athlete to to you know. If I was and the problem was I was lefty lefty. Like if I had been a second baseman, you never know because I could hit. Like my my good friend Jeff got signed by the Blue Jays and he was basically like Jimmy. When we take batting practice, you can hit with like every guy on the roster except two. The problem is it's the first baseman, the left fielder, and that's where you play. They both got million dollar <laughs> signing bonuses and they hit, they hit twenty homers a year. It's like you hit forever. Yeah. Like, so it's like, not, like if you were a second baseman, who knows, but, but that's <laughs> that lefty second baseman. Come on. Yeah. It was basically just learning to, I always told the story as I, I was in my own head. I thought too much. I didn't just, it was like, just do as a hitter. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of life lessons, like with baseball, the ups and downs, life's about not getting down. Like when things get down, like you got to stay up and baseball is the same way. You're going to have slumps, but you just got to like stay, stay level. And you know, basically learning to just not think, have a plan, have a strategy and just execute. Um, and once I kind of got that, I really started to work hard. Um, you know, I was literally doing, I mean, it's, it was D3, but I took it very seriously. I, I did like a rods, like pregame workout, you know what I mean? Like 500 swings before every game. Like I joke about that in my videos, but that's actually what I did at the D3 level. I, mean, I was obsessed. I was sick, Yeah, <laughs> but like it's, it, it ended up, you know, to me playing division three baseball, to go back to your original question, it was about like maximizing your potential. Like I didn't care that I wasn't D1. I just wanted to be the best baseball player that I could be. So I said, you know, so at the end of the day, I could say I, I was the best ball player that I could have been, you know, 
We have a, we have a joke, you know, because I played uh, Division Two. We have a joke, which was I chose D. There, there were there was in the 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 regionals. They'd have I chose Division Two. We're like, what the hell is that side? It's like, no, I chose Division One. Division One unchose me. You right, know what right, I mean? right, right, right. It's, not, it's uh, who chooses Division Two or Three? Like, we want we want the big leagues. Come on, but right, it, right. it's honestly this this. It, we get pigeonholed and you know, the game of baseball, right? You're at Fitchburg state on any given day. Maybe if they played the, like the Red Sox single a team could win. Right. It's just, right. so it's just anybody who knows the game of baseball understands these. It's a different thing. It's, it's not like basketball where or talent, football it's athletes, or football right? athletes. It's just get this guy, have him run as fast as he can. You know, it's a different game. Um, right. The yeah, Fitchburg state me- corner can't cover a division one receiver. So the game's over. No. You know what I mean? Where it's like with a D three baseball game, if you got a guy who can pitch, like you might be in a game, you know. Yeah, so, you different. It's, right? it's, so you also talked a little bit about like you started seeing a psychiatrist in college a little bit, right? And so you did, did a, little you, did, a little bit, and you were able to you um, you said you kind of had a breakthrough when you were able to find that your your AD, ADD was cured by Adderall. Is that something that you you went? Yeah, well, that was a double edged sword in my life. Yeah, I yeah. mean, all, I started taking Adderall too. I I, I was in a slump. And it's, it's actually a funny story, but it's also not a funny story. But like, so I was not prescribed Adderall and a lot of college kids, like I took Adderall before, um, you know, for class and for studying. Yeah. So like, I, I think one day I had to take an Adderall to like do a paper and I banged down and I had to practice. And it was like right in the middle, of like me really slumping my sophomore year it was my first year as a starter. And like really struggling with it. Cause I was like a good high school player. And like, I thought oh, I'd dominate division three. And like, I'm hitting like 150 through like 10 games. You know what I mean? So like, <laughs> I'm like what the hell is going on? Right. And um, I just took an Adderall and I showed his batting practice. It was like awful round. It was like missile, 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 missile. And I'm like, what's going on? I'm like, I can just see the ball. It's like a beach ball right now. And <laughs> I was just, it was my concentration and it like kind of like reduced my anxiety. And then like, it was helping me with school. So then like I, you know, I started getting prescribed it and um, over time, and this is in the movie too. Like I, I really struggled with like, I, I eventually started abusing Adderall, um, you know, particularly like during like my divorce, I got divorced. And then like, I was in a relationship after that. And like, I was like, nobody even knew it. Like I was just like shoveling Adderall in my mouth and it caused a lot of damage in like my personal life and my career and stuff. And um, you know, no excuse I mean, for that, but like, it, it's one of those things. It's like, it, it did help me a lot in my life, but then to me, you know, you come off a of depression. If you're abusing Adderall, there's no worse depression than coming right. off of it, the come down from it. Um, it's pretty bad. And it's like serious. Like you can, you know, I'm sure you got, there have been people who have, uh, you know, committed suicide because yeah. they're so depressed when they come off that stuff. That's how bad it is. Yeah. I mean, I have the worst ADHD. I probably fidget a million times in this interview. Right. I, I was prescribed Adderall and I swear, I mean, I, and I was one of these guys I was taking, like, I take it once a week. And this is while I was in the corporate world, same, similar, right. and, you know, idea in uh, looking at Excel sheets. I just couldn't, I'm like, man, I can't muster I can't. the, I don't even want to do it. Like how, how, what are these people, you know? So I, uh, cause everybody's really, doing it. <laughs> everyone's doing it it's literally right. it's like the big leagues like it's just the dumb ones who are getting caught with the sauce right, right. and everyone's doing it they're having a great time i'm like what is every, how is everyone so excited to do work and you know it, you know it, it was tough and then i started doing it right boom promotion <laughs> right. I mean? it's like yeah. it's like you know it's like right away boom promotion i'm playing better uh basketball i'm uh, writing better jokes i'm you know i was able to burn the candle at both ends i could literally have two jobs i could do, go do comedy and work a corporate job yeah and right and have and have a love life um so it, it really is a, it's a terrible it's a terrible thing when you you know abuse it right obviously it's right. great I, I struggled with that what was your max that you were taking in a day when it was really you're on that bender what was the milligram over 100 about 90 okay so wow. like i mean i would think about 90 right the three the 30s are the max dose right the time released yeah, yeah there was a couple i mean it was just dumb. i was t- I was and like mixing more it with, than that. Yeah. Yeah. And like, were you mixing it with booze too? I That's was, right. I would do it with like a, I have a, a sliver of coffee and it would be like, Pow! but yeah. yeah, I, I, I didn't really drink too much on it, but a lot of, that's where I kind of first found out about it. It was like people were drinking so that they could drink throughout the night. Uh, but mainly it was just something that I, I, I knew I needed. I was just like feeling like, man, I need something. And I went and saw a therapist and they kind of, they prescribed it. But it was those instant release boppers, those IRs. And and I know so many people who are taking it that have had similar experiences where 
you yeah. know, you have this positive stuff and then if you can't control it. Um, wow. It gets, it gets, there's the, the, the dark side. If you, you have take- depression, it, you, like you're using it as a mask, it's self-medicating, yeah. you know, and that's what was happening with me. I was getting like deeply depressed and like, I was just leaning on it. It was bad. And it, cure, it cures depression. I mean, you it were does. totally temporary. Right. It's like, <laughs> temporary. Yeah. Yeah. The short term. Dep- I mean, it's like you were, it, 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 that's the thing that I think uh, nobody it's not on there is that like you feel better for a short period of time. Right. It's sort of like, I imagine some, like some PEDs, right. You know, you, right. I felt better. I don't want to say I felt really good. I felt my ego was like strong. I, I felt like confidence. You know, that's the confidence was the thing that like it br- gave me this bravado and this confidence that I didn't have before. Not that I'm not, an, I'm not like unconfident, like I'm strong in my will, but damn, it made me feel like I was the one. Right. And then right. all of a sudden that crash, it's where, and I, I had the similar thing with, with the work, with work. And I had a, a mental episode, which like uh, sucked, you know, it was just like seeing things that aren't there living the world, uh, living in a world that isn't reality. And yeah, that is, that is wild that we're giving this to so many kids. It's just crazy. It really is. <sighs> it's, it's dangerous. It's I know. Like I've, I've like, I obviously have a son and I, I've already thought about all that. It's like, I got to protect them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when it's time for it. I think there's a time and place for it. Yeah. But, like, not when he's a kid. So can you tell me about your relationship with uh, your, your trainer, the WWE alumni, Matt Heisen, uh, better known as Spike Dudley. Yeah. He was your trainer, right? Yeah. He was like one of really, so I got bit. out of college and um, like, that's when I really, I guess, I mean, I, I did some shows. I started as a senior in high school yeah. for top rope promotions. Um, but like, it was when I really got trained by him at the lockup Academy where like, I, I became like a pro. I had like really legit gear. I was in shape. Spike thought I had a lot of potential. Spike and I have actually kind of fallen out of contact over the years. I think Spike was disappointed because like he saw a guy who had, you know, the most, the most potential of any guy that he got taught. And like, I, I didn't make it cause I had issues with mental health and uh, mm. you know, a lot of people think that's sad. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why, I'm ready to move. I had this conversation with a good friend of mine who started with me and he you know, basically said that it was sad. It was like, you were the guy, Jim, like you, you were the guy who was supposed to be a star. You had the look, you were an athlete, like all that stuff. He goes, and you just, you kind of messed it up because of this. And it's like, yeah, but I think there's a valuable lesson to be learned in that. And that's why I want to tell the story and uh, bring some attention to it. But, but, you know, I think also people, when they say you messed it up because of this, it's like potential is, you also did it. I know about you. I know your. I know a lot right. about you. I followed your stuff. Lot, right. You've accomplished a lot. You know these right. people are like, hey man, you could have done this. You're like, dude, I don't know. I'm still. It's also never too. I'm late. the happiest like, also- I've been. You know what I mean? It's yeah. Like- it's like fuck you. Yeah, right. <laughs> like you could have been somebody. You're like I mean, am I dead I like, yet? I, like, I'm I feel not dead. Good. I'm like a rock yeah. star dad. Like that's all I care about, really. So <laughs> God, I could bench three fifteen. I wake up yeah. no problem. At least I still for- look good. Yeah. Still got it. Got the confidence of a Greek God here, guys. What the hell is your deal? So uh, obviously, you know, your gym, your gym routine is important. What's your, you know, do you have any rituals when you get in the gym? Uh, what are they? And how do you repeat them uh, to get in kind of like a meditative state or to get into the, it's, the zone? It's, it's crazy. And that's why, like, I think it's very important. Like to, um, one of the reasons I say like to get out of depression is like having a dream, like me having this movie, like it might not happen, but I had this visualization in my mind that I'd run over and over about like a certain scene and what I'd be doing. And like, there's like a visualization exercise that is like helpful to meeting your goals. And I used to do it on the on deck circle, like as a baseball mm-hmm. player, you know, you, you like, you are dreaming about positive things as like the music's playing and you're going through your set. And like, I find myself doing that when I wanted to be a pro wrestler, it was like me coming down the aisle at like the Boston, you know, the Boston guard yeah. place is going nuts. Like I would think about stuff like that. And it would make me channel intensity and do some like special stuff in the gym you know what i mean so like that's that's the visualization stuff that i do like i'm just thinking about like why am i here like the reason why i'm trying to get in shape is potentially this movie that's happening so like visualizing certain things um to get my juices flowing and i think it's healthy because it pushes you towards the the finish line but very and similar then- to warming up in the on deck circle and you're just thinking this guy's gonna throw this pitch here and i'm gonna you know pull my hands and hit one out you know with this film, are you going to star in it as well? Is it like kind of write, write, direct, and also starring? I think there's a, so the thing is what we're struggling with is like, it's still in development. Like I've done the most I can do with the draft. It's like, we're waiting on a final script. We got to get, I, like, I want to get it done soon for me to want to act in it. Like this, shoot it this year or next. Like, I don't want to be 40 and doing it. If it yeah. continues to do that, like the, the beauty of a movie script is like, we can change the name and have somebody else act in it. We can like sell the script. You know what I yeah. mean? I do want to act in it just because it's, 
symbolically my life. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's personal to me. And, you know, this is that, that box that I want to check off from like a personal fulfillment standpoint. It's like, I didn't get signed, but I created this like awesome comedy. You know what yeah. I mean? People will remember. And like, that's, that's kind of all I, I want to do at this point. And then be my son's little league dad, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, is he a lefty too? Does he swing left? So he's lefty righty. Cause I, I, you know, oh, if, he, smart, if he ends up being player. a good hitter, it's like, Put him at second base, and he's fast. I think he's going to be faster than he's got his mom's wheels. Yeah, <laughs> thank God, thank, thank God. God, we can't thank have God. Good. my seven two sixty wasn't getting me signed. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, <laughs> that that five three forty. I mean, you and me both, brother. I I was a kid. I started swinging lefty. My dad didn't know he got into baseball after, you know, in 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 pony league. The first guy had me go from lefty to right handed hitting. I could yeah. still drop dick, but it was you know you're a righty. I was slow. And the curveball came around. I couldn't really hang with that. Yeah. But the lefty, a natural, just what am I doing here? Yeah, lefty natural swing, which is, I mean, you can't put paper on it. You can't put it on paper. So, uh, when was the when was the first time you knew you had uh, the gift of gab? Uh, was it in in moot court? In, in or was it you know in, you know when was this? I mean, obviously, you won most likely to be famous in two thousand three yeah. in high school. Uh, yeah, in, in high school. Everybody- in moot- yeah. And mo- what's moot court? Is this like a debate team? Is that what it is? Yeah. So like in college, I did like, you know, I was a political science major. I thought I wanted to yeah. be an attorney. So, you know, we did, you know, debating, like yeah. it was a constitutional law. So it was like my particular case was about like the constitutional, the constitutionality of this case where it was like a, a clash between like the interstate commerce clause and what the federal government can regulate in the second amendment. And you had to argue both sides. It wasn't like a political thing. Yeah. Uh, it was about public speaking and stuff. And like, that's when everyone, like, I thought I sucked. I had so much anxiety and like, I talked about my more baggage than Logan airport, you know, like I get up there, I th- I'm like, I think I'm shaking. And like, I get down and they're like, you are really good at this. And I'm like, really? Like I was like shaking, but like, I realized I had a talent for public speaking and, um, you know, I ended up, you know, finishing third in new England. We beat like people from Holy cross, like, you know, and I'm a state school kid, you know what I mean? And like, we performed really well, went to the nationals. Um, so yeah, that's when I learned I could like, I, there's something about people like always like who criticize like my promo work, but I was like, hey, he's an 80s promo. He's this and that. It was really, I, I had conviction when I spoke. I had confidence. I had presence on screen or a presence when I speak. And that's almost more important than coming up with like a creative one liner, like particularly like wrestling promos and stuff. So like I learned that about myself then that like I had the, the ability to public speak and like I've done a couple like eulogies and stuff. And I think I've done a pretty good, like my family and my best man speech yeah. and stuff. And people are always like, that's really, that was really memorable. You know what I mean? So like, I've always been able to do that. And, like I remember in college, I would do wrestling promos because I was such a wrestling fan. So like they would do like Rick Martel, WrestleMania eight, go. And, like, would be like, all right. Like, Anka, you know, and I did the, the promo or, you know, the ultimate warrior at WrestleMania six. Like I could just, and then I got in the corporate world and like, you know, in your twenties and like, I was a sales guy, we'd go out and drink and like, I would cut my own promos. You know what I mean? Just cause so, that's why I was into wrestling. I was into the promos, the character Ric Flair and stuff. And then when I got back into wrestling, when I was 27, I took some time off. I was just Jimmy Preston. I decided to bring back that character I created in high school and I started doing videos. And next thing you know, things went viral. And- yeah. What, and so what was that like, like, you know, when you did the alumni uh, viral video and, you know, him, him, him and she hold the chi, you know, what, 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 what did it, how long did it take before it went truly viral? Was it just overnight or did you, you, you captured the video and then the next day, what was that like? This, this? It's funny. I did the video. I was like doing it for my friends. Like I just started this over the top character, the one man thrill ride and yeah. I was at practice. I was talking to my buddy Craig and it was 50, 50, like half the wrestling school was like, dude, this is hack. Like this is what they did in the eighties. But like other people were like, no, but it's really good eighties. Like he's like, <laughs> ripping off these catchphrases and one-liners it's like it's really entertaining so i, I was just talking shit about, about my excuse my language talking trash about oh, the alumni on. game because we had for whatever reason i just knew who was playing from the alumni team and the guys were like still kind of young and it was like all our like con- all conference guys yeah and like we had two of our aces who were like never even on the same team pitching coming back and i was like and like they, i knew the program went downhill since my coach left and i was like we're and i'm just talking to craig i'm like we're gonna win this game <laughs> and the alumni my team had never won, had never beaten the, the roster. No. You know what I mean? And um, and, so, and like she goes, you know what you need to do? You need to cut a promo before the game as the thrill ride. And I was like, <laughs> all right, I'll do it. And like I was on the way up and I did it. And I hit and I did it in one take. And I was like, I think that I think everyone's gonna love that. Like my friends. 
and I posted on Facebook, play the game. We won. <laughs> and uh, I get to my car. I had like 500 likes on Facebook. I'm like, what? What? And then I guess it, it you know, I ended up getting on Barstool. You know, I think yeah. Bill Burr found it. I ended up on MLB Network, on Mike and Mike in the Morning, like WEI. It was the Red, during the Red Sox World Series run. So like before every series, I did a promo on the team on, you know, the Boston's media outlet. And that's how I was sort of off from there. <laughs> But yeah, that was crazy. But did a lot 88, 88 and pus. I mean, I, you know, I, they, that game was a little intense because like I wanted to win. And like, I remember like taking swings in the on deck circle and like the, the kids were like almost mocking me. Like, look at this, look at this guy, 27 year old taking this game seriously. <laughs> and I used to think the same way when I was playing and I was like, and then I, yeah, I got down like one, two, and this lefty like tried to throw a curveball the other way. I just had a missile to the left. And I was just like, I fucked the bat and like looked at the <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you can't just hang. because I'm old doesn't mean I wasn't a good ball player, brother. Like, hey, boy, I'm still 27. It was a little bit of, yeah, I'm still in my come prime, on. dude. I mean, you're in your prime. I mean, that's like, right. I mean, come on. And so, it was, uh, you know, Oppo. Yeah, it was Oppo, Oppo. Oppo like Taco, baby. You actually did it. You predicted the future. I didn't even know that. Yeah, I didn't Damn. go. Through, I had an infield hit and I hit a single the other way, but we won like eight to three. We did the hidden ball trick and, you know, <laughs> yeah, it's a block. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's off the rubber. You don't even know the rules. I, I had words with that. I was like, do you even know the rules? I'm a college baseball player. <laughs> you got, it's not a block. You got it's not a block. You're off taking your primary lead when the pitcher's not on the mound. You should be picked off. <laughs> like, you got it. They got hidden ball trick. That's they got incredible. hidden ball trick by the old men. <laughs> It was Eight, a little three? personal. They were like kind of like mocking us and stuff. And like, meanwhile, I'm sitting my Jeff who like played two years of pro ball. I'm like, they don't know we're about to beat them, though, do they? <laughs> That's crazy. That is actually, I've never heard of an alumni group yeah. winning. An alumni they played team. like crap too. They kicked the ball around and stuff. They had their freshman playing, but like it was still, it was probably still. embarrassing for them. So obviously you have your father, you have uh, a, a lot of mentors. Any mentors that, you know, stand out for you today and, and how'd you find them or how'd they find you? I would say that actually my college baseball coach, I feel like I should, I've mentioned him a couple of times and I feel like I should reach out to him. It's been a long time, but yeah. he, you know, he was the guy who like kind of saw potential in me kind of as a baseball player and like as a person and uh, you know, recognized my weaknesses, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And brought them to the forefront. And um, you know, I tried to coach for him after I got out of school, but he moved to Pennsylvania and like the GA program got cut. Like I wanted to be a teacher. That was like what I wanted to do like be a high school baseball coach and a teacher. Uh, but they cut the GA program. I ended up not working with him, but you know, he, he was a great guy. And almost a father figure, even though he was only like 12 years older than me, like he's a relatively young guy, all conference, like a coach of the yeah. year. His team is in the division three college world series and stuff. Yes. They're good, good program. So he's a good guy. And what, my father, and what's, obviously, what's your coach's, what's his name? His name's Pete Egbert. So Pete he's Egbert. a great coach. Get a shout out Pete. Come on, yeah. baby. We He's love you. Coach. You're you got to reach out to him. Come on. I, I do. I, it's been a long time. So I, I still got to reach out to my, my coach. Life. Right. It's, it's an interesting thing, right? When you have a deep connection with a coach, you're like, man, I, you know, you're more than you are a father figure. And, and many was coach O'Brien for me. So, you know, that's really cool. Um, while, while your persona is that of a buff man who exudes endless confidence, there's more to you than meets the eye. How do you, um, how do you kind of, shape this now as you're kind of going through obviously your your father three-year-old how do you like what's the the next phase obviously you have your film but uh is there is the character thrill ride going to be a little different is the thrill ride going to go to like some marches like what's going on what do, what do we do here no and that's and that's kind of why i wanted to do the film it was like to show like an evolution of the character when i started i kind of lacked self-confidence in the one-man thrill ride was an act as it started happening, like I started developing real confidence and I sort of almost became that guy. Like, yeah, it was like almost like I wasn't playing a character. That was who I was. And then as it, <laughs> as I realized my dreams weren't going to come true, it was like, all right, then why are you still acting like this douchebag? You know what I mean? Like you need to, you need to be able to separate the two and, you know, I guess it depends which, uh, which girl you ask of how, <laughs> like the difference between Jim and the throw ride, you know what I mean? Which X. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like, there's, but there is a difference, but it's, it's part of my personality. And as I get older, it's like, I think it's important that, you know, my son understand that number one, I'm playing a character. Number two, um, like there's a lesson to be learned from all of it. Was this, the thrill ride is obviously self-proclaimed or was it given to you by uh, a couple of some women? No, it's, it's totally self-proclaimed. That's why oh, it's so okay. funny. 
No, the story was like, I was in high school and like, so football, I, I focused on my junior year. I didn't play. And so when we went to football camp, uh, we had to, you know, we had a talent show and because I didn't play, I had to go up with the sophomores and do the thing. And I was the main event. I was on last, of course. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, yeah. And, um, nobody, and everybody bombed. It was usually the best part of camp and like, nobody guys put icy hot on their balls. Nobody was laughing. Like, it, like the coach was like, this sucks. You know what I mean? Like it was like, it was bombing. And the story with me was like in high school, I was kind of like, you know, good ball player, pretty handsome guy, but for whatever reason, I couldn't like, close the deal with the girl. You know what I mean? Like I was yeah. known for like, Jim's still a virgin. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> how is that possible? So I basically was a poem making fun of myself, no matter how much weight I curl, I can't get with any girl or all yeah. this stuff. But it ended with me at the end, by the end of this year, I'm going to find a chick. I just, I just broke out the the injection of genetic perfection line and said, she'll be calling me. Yeah, I feel right. The place went nuts. You know what I mean? Crush it. You know I mean? Place went I'm an injection of genetic perfection. I receive it and she's going to find out well, I'm the one man. I feel right. And that was sad. <laughs> like when I was born and that's like the character I created, you know, it's one of those things like the one man throw right was really cool when you were 18, but when you're 36, it's really not. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless there's evolution with the character, it's like, you don't want to be that guy. I, I mean, it's still fun. I, what are you talking about? It's still about? fun. I, I, I want to see my the inner one child man. is what it yeah. is. I want to see the one man throw ride at 55 years old or like, you know, Rick flaring it at 80. You know what I mean? Just for, with your giant, you know, still sort of jacked old yeah. guy ripped. I, it's yeah. not, you better not stop it. Um, no, so that's so the thing. And that's why like Pat, like uh, the guy who's potentially directing has helped me write it. He came up with the idea of the movie, like the idea of like watching this one man throw ride, go through therapy is hilarious. And right. like struggling with a breakup, like hilarious, like acting like a meathead, <laughs> like, and like doing something ridiculous to try to like get her back. And like, he's trying to like figure out like that, that whole thing is hilarious. So I like to sold me on doing it because like I had a script written and like, we're like, yeah, this sucks. We're going to do it. He suggests and he uh -huh. outlined it. And so that's why I'm really looking forward to it. I think it's, it'll, it'll, people will like it if it gets done. So, yeah. No, and I think, and I think no matter what you should do it because like there's so many options with it, especially with your reach, you know, even from an Indiegogo type of thing, right. A lot of distributors actually like when you do crowds, you know, crowdfunding, right. Uh, Cause it gets people uh, pocket pot committed to your project. So you're going to do it. You know, it just might be like the scale and indie features just like indie wrestling. Uh, they have a huge following and they grow and it's a 10 year, you know, you make the film and you have a 10 year P and L um and and you'll right. make your money back you know it's it's also just you got to do it like don't just come on keep closing like you did 2020 right, deals right. and you'll finance it yourself um so you were you were obviously you could and, and, and am i correct in that you could bench you said three 315 in high school is that for real i did 365 on the bench my senior year i was 190 pounds on that wow so yeah, mm -hmm. that, like the, so the steroids thing always came up, you know, and I, I was against it growing up. I was just gifted from like an upper body strength standpoint, I think. Like, yeah. You know, I probably should have competed in weightlifting, but you know, I, I actually haven't touched that type of weight since like now I train totally different. I train dumbbells, you know what I mean? You get yeah. the same effect, you know, it's for cosmetics basically health, but yeah, I was a strong kid. And then, so obviously at one point, did you take this, um, did you ever take any PEDs and then like, yeah. to, you know, to sustain that youth? I mean, we're kind of, when we're 18, we have that natural testosterone. Yep. Um, when, and when, when was that? And how did that, how did you, how did that affect you? And that always got asked when I, when I struggle with depression, because people were like, you know, that's one of the side effects of steroids. Um, and I've been open and honest about it and I have a kid, so I have to be, you know, cautious about everything I say about it. Um, but you know, I started when I was like 28, like at the time I was five, nine, 210 pounds, the strongest guy in the gym, like repping 315. You know what I mean? So it was like, so I always took it personally when people would say like, well, he's cheating. It's like, well, I'm already pound for pound the strongest guy in the gym. Like, <laughs> like, I'm doing this to get paid. Like, I don't understand yeah. people like, will say, Hey, you know, guys will text me. I want to get ripped for the beach this summer. What's the best cycle? I'm like, yeah, uh, don't take steroids. You idiot. Like, like <laughs> you know, you don't need to take steroids to look good or feel good about yourself. Like that's, that's sick. Like to me, I made the decision because it was like, I think this is a, it's going to make my Delton traps look a little bigger. So I look like <laughs> more of a cartoon character. I'm, I'm a cartoon character. The thrill rides a cartoon character, you know, just make it a little more, you know, real. So that's why I did it. And I never like really took a lot of it, but um, the only time I really struggled with it is the last time I took it 
which was 2019. It was like the last time I made a run as a wrestler. I came off in like October of 2019. And that's like when I really started to spiral from a depression standpoint. But I think there were a ton of factors at play and not just that. I think the Adderall was the bigger issue to be, to be honest. Really? And that's sort of what, uh, you know, professionals think too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy that like the, it's crazy that the, the psychiatrists are like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's the drugs we prescribed you. Right, right. <laughs> that's what caused this to be way worse right i mean yeah, it's kind of like, a it's a perfect segue to our kind of like our sec- second chance like stop the stigma section we're going to take a moment to be grateful for moments like these where we can have a sip of coffee or tea the broken dove podcast is sponsored by kilo kilo app takes a qualitative approach to tracking your mental health by analyzing the quality of your sleep workout diet even libido kilo keeps me dialed in Kilo motivates me to work hard in and out of the gym. It also helps me maintain relationships and keep perspective because no matter how bad you got it, someone has it worse. And trust this, we need you out there. Maybe do it for your son, your student. Do it for someone you've yet to meet, your inner savage. Dig in and do work. Kilo, building better humans. Back in, back in. I mean, we've been talking about it the whole damn time, so it doesn't really yeah. matter. But you know, the the idea of, of of overcoming mental health and and mental illness and just like the the things we do to our body, even as an athlete, right? Like it can uh, create a presiding issue uh, that is unhealthy. And and you just talking about it, I think, is going to blow people's mind. You know, about what what is okay, what is acceptable. Also, this is something that more people are talking about now than ever. Um, right. How do you? How do you feel that, you know, you're, you're doing with it? Like, and how do you, what's the day to day? Like, are you journaling? What do you do more than just uh, talk therapy? Anything, anything you can give us any tips and tricks? Like I actually reached a point where I stopped talk therapy because I thought talk therapy was reinforcing like my sadness or whatever. Mm. I, I mean, my story was, you know, I, I dealt with a lot in a five-year period from not getting signed to WWE, getting married, having a child, getting divorced, um, you know, struggles with wrestling, career stuff, financial stuff, uh, going through like, you know, issues with women, breakups. Uh, and I just reached a point, like I was angry, very angry, like during my divorce. And like, it actually started around, I fought for rough, rough and rowdy. It was around that time when things started to go downhill after the fight, mm-hmm. my marriage started falling apart. And I went through like two years where I was just a miserable dick to every person I came across. And like, I pushed a lot of my friends, family, women, like out of my life. Uh, just by being a real jerk and like, you know, an event happened sort of at the end of uh, 2019 where like it, it sort of just became sadness after that. And like, I realized that like I was doing something wrong and I needed to fix it. And um, I'm not sure how we got here. I don't know what the question was, but no, no, no. That's (laughs) That's great. Did you have like a, like a, like a a breakdown or like, was it like a, a, an episode? Is that what you mean? Like kind of like a, cause I, I personally had one. I, I had, I've had two. One was like actual, just a total bummer where I was seeing things that weren't really there. I wasn't yeah. even on, I wasn't even on drugs or anything at the time. Right. I just it came out, it came about at 27. I think that's when they say it's sort of like, you know, some of your mental health can kind of start presenting itself as in your late twenties, early thirties. But yeah. I had something like that happen and it was just awful. I mean, I, it was at work when I'm over there, I, whatever, went and gave a, a pitched a, a movie at, on the lot as I'm crossing Paul Feig and some people got upset about it. So you can't pitch a movie to a director. I'm like, I'm a fucking director. You just don't know. <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I, might, yeah. I might be wearing, you, I deal with it. You guys are all, you guys are all the normies. Right, uh, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it didn't work. It didn't work out. It was so awkward. And I, I mean, just getting shamed at work. It was like, it was really tough to go yeah. back. And I, and I went on disability personally and I went on disability for like three months and I just was so embarrassed, such an yeah. embarrassing feeling like that. Well, I mean, I, I think that's the thing too, particularly with men. And that's why yeah. I think, you know, my following the people who actually follow me, like it's 95% men. And I think yeah. it's a conversation that women are more comfortable having. I mean, this is a stereotype of course, and things and times are changing, but like, there's a definitely a stigma with mental health when it comes to men. And yeah. And that's really what my movie, like the script is really about. It's like, it's, it's the way we were raised and there's nothing wrong with the way we were raised. I think there's a mm-hmm. lot of value in the way we were raised, but it needs to kind of be modified to like a more modern approach, a more modern contemporary discussion about like what masculinity truly is and 
it's okay to be depressed, but you got to take responsibility and pull yourself out of it because you owe it to the people that you're closest to, you know, to be emotionally healthy, mentally mm -hmm. healthy, physically healthy. So I don't know. It's a conversation that needs to be had. And I think bringing it up in a funny way is like the best way to do it versus like having like a Hallmark, you know, <laughs> there's too much of that right now. It's like, let's, everybody wants to laugh. So, right. I mean, it's, it's wild. Even this podcast, I think mean, you'd say like, I, I don't know, 75% female. That's our audience, really? you know? So, and we talk about men's mental health. And so, you know, and all I, I predominantly men are on here and it's still for whatever reason, the, the, the audience is female based and it just might be what, you know, at this point, we're still, still growing that, that male audience for this, to have this conversation, to even listen to it. Uh, it's why you're, you're spot on. We are, we're not kind of programmed to, to want to unpack these things. And yet men are going around more than ever fucking doing these shootings. And, and obviously there's like this mental breakdown that's happening, right? There's a, right. there's a, a disconnect in our society. I'm stoked that you're brave and doing this. And especially with, you know, family and, and a job, like you're, you're not just the thrill ride. You're the no. real ride. Yeah, no, I've had <laughs> a lot, I've had a lot going on and like to, you know, I, I'm kind of approaching this a little differently. Like my, the lesson I learned from pro wrestling is I didn't go all in. I played it safe. I always had like a corporate gig. You know what I mean? Like I was, yeah. I was did well, you know what I mean? I guess. So like during this, I've had like an opportunity to kind of just focus on nothing but the movie. Um, yeah. Just because my closest friends in wrestling, we were the three guys that were going to make, it was like Matt Taven, Mike Bennett. They focused on nothing but wrestling. Matt has a college degree. He could have gotten a corporate job. He just decided I'm going all in. He won a world championship in Madison Square Garden, sold out. Mike was in WWE. You now they wrestled for New Jersey. I have an ultimate respect for those guys. They went all in. So that's sort of how I'm approaching this movie until I can't anymore. <laughs> you know No, what I mean? you got to. So it's kind of like the lesson I've learned in my life. And that's, you know, I guess that's why this story is so personal to me, I guess. Well, it's, I mean, it sounds uh, fantastic. It kind of feels like the wrestler, obviously with like a younger, a younger approach and a more modern version, you know, yeah. uh, Eastbound uh, and down meets silver linings playbook. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I know Eastbound and do Eastbound and down is my favorite television show ever. And silver right. linings playbooks, incredible. So even, even then with a little bit of, with a little bit of athleticism too. I mean, fucking right. Kenny powers, you are kind of like, come on, right. let's be you're the wrestling Kenny powers. Right. Hey, yo, that's April. I, yeah, <laughs> yo, that's April. exactly it. That's what somebody said to me. And I was like, yeah, that's the perfect way to pitch the film. And it's, yeah. that's what it is. So, yeah. And I mean, they would probably get, they would love it. I mean, have you, have you reached out to Danny McBride and their team at all? No, no, I've, I want to keep in, that on the DL. I have reached time. out to people. I'm talking, I've been talking to people. So you're, you're going to slow poke it. Okay. So that's yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, whatever, spoil it. Um, yeah. So this is our, our next section is just super quick. We're at the end here. And we're going to do the rapid fire. So these are uh, as quick as you can, no thoughts. And you're going to, it's an either or. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Bret Hart or Lex Luger. Bret Hart. Buys or tries. Uh, tries okay bench or dips bench hogan or randy savage Ooh. <laughs> i know uh, i got you are we talking about money or are we talking about who i like more personally i go randy savage okay hogan, randy was, Sav money. hogan was money though right i mean come on yeah. kane or undertaker undertaker right mankind or triple h mankind made triple h but uh I think if you look at the body of work and what he's accomplished in the business, Triple H. Okay. Ric Flair or Jake the Snake? Ric Flair. Jake Come was incredible, that. though. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin or The Rock? Stone Cold Steve Austin. And, I, and personally, as a fan, I like The Rock. And I had this discussion with my best friend from wrestling, Mark Sherman. It's like The Rock is obviously the bigger star. But in terms of who the greatest professional wrestler of all time was, it's Steve Austin. And his, his autobiography, his biography is on A&E tonight. And I'm like oh, really, look, really looking forward to watching it. He's the, he's the greatest ever, Steve Austin. I mean, Total and he slammed beers. Come on, yeah, don't we all? He, he was a badass, man. He was, he was cool when wrestling was cool. You know, he was, the, he was my favorite. I mean, if I'm being real, Stone Cold Steve Austin. I mean, I used to do the stunner. I mean, we, yeah. I think you and I probably, we, I had a wrestling birthday party where you just put some pillows down and you just start slamming each other. Brock Lesnar or John Cena? Yeah, those guys are like the two last superstars of pro wrestling. So that's tough to say. I'll say Lesnar because he's a better athlete and he, because he had the MMA, he's kind of, yeah. like a, he's become sort of a bigger star, but I think John Cena is one of the greatest ever from Massachusetts guy too. 
I think he's a hell of a wrestler. He gets criticized by the internet for not being a great wrestler. And they're just so clueless. He's had great matches with everybody. One of the, one of the greatest ever top 10 for sure. Top five. Really? And, and he just has such crazy arms. I've seen him in the fl- I've actually yeah. shot stuff with he's him. He's a ge- genetic freak. He's a genetic freak. It's just like, what is going on with these, these ape-like arms that are super vasculated? Like, what in the hell? I ne- So I never really met him. I, I was near him when I worked as an extra for WWE. And I remember yeah. he's like, you know, he's the superstar. So he's kind of like off on his own, doing his own thing. But yeah. like, I walked by him and I was like surprised that he had like the big baggy John Cena t-shirt on. Yeah. And like, because he's only like 5'11". And I'm just yeah. like, he's not that big. Like, and I was like, at the time, it was probably the most jacked I ever was. And I was like, I, <laughs> I think I'm like as big. As, and then like, he took his shirt off. And I was like, holy shit. No, he's just like on another level. Yeah. Like, he's just <laughs> so shredded. When he took his shirt off, he looked 30 pounds bigger than he was. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, he's just a absolute freak of nature. Like, you just have incredible genetics. To be that big and that lean, It's you can't do it unless you have good genes. And I think also just like... M- discipline that guy is so yeah probably disciplined all right so uh favorite song to work out to i actually like my like entrance music that's why i pick it as my entrance music my entrance music is always like my favorite song to work out to so i i porn star dancing as a silence that was like my original entrance music by <laughs> my dark it's like terrible butt rock but it's like what you hear a strip club it's perfect for them that's all right and then the man by the killers which is also like that my heel music is just if you've ever listened to the lyrics of the killers the man it's like USDA it's, certified lean. He just talks about I was got money in the bank and stuff, and like nothing gets him down. It's it's per the lyrics are perfect. Burger or hot dog? Depends if I'm if I'm at baseball game, hot dog, but burger. Yeah, pizza or pasta? Pizza. Post weight training meal favorite. Oh, I've actually had a lot of luck with intermittent fasting lately. I could go on all day. I think the fitness industry is kind of a scam. Some of it, like really, six square meal. Yeah, I got I I've. I'm getting close to my best shape and I'm not eating nearly as diet as strict with my diet. I used to like shredded chicken and a sweet potato and like brown rice because it's, but now, and and now, and now what are you doing? What do you, so So I do much more flexible dieting. So I eat one meal a day at like 7 PM. Um, and like, I'm not afraid to like, you know, you're so restricted from a caloric standpoint. Like if I need to, if I want to have a chocolate chip cookie, I do it. You know what I mean? Like I'm not as strict and like, I'm just as strong as I've ever been about like 205 pounds, like in good shape. I'm not as ripped as I want to be if like this thing gets made, but I'll get there. Like I'm in position to get there. So, and it's, and I haven't been nearly as strict as I was in my late twenties when I was like measuring chicken and broccoli. And and that was just painful, right? It was just painful. Pain. It's just, it takes so much time. It's like, it's, that's worse than the train. Like dieting's easy. Like having the discipline to eat right is easy. It's the preparation, the cleanup and all that. It's like, I got bills to pay and I got a three-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> like I got diapers to change and yeah. bills to pay. Come on, baby. So, so obviously let's, you know, do you have anything you want to plug your, your, your handles, your YouTube, whatever it is? Yeah, sure. You can follow me on Instagram at, at one man for a ride. That's the number one man for a ride. I actually have a new merch store. That's like, we're, we're loading it up. we got new sunnies coming in. We got multiple new designs. So we're going to start launching that. And like, I, I've done content the last couple of weeks. I'm starting to bring it back um you know to promote the 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 movie that we're trying to produce so that's coming soon you can follow me on instagram i do a lot of igtv youtube slash one man throw ride facebook one man throw ride and i think on twitter it's throw ride one but really instagram is my best platform if you want to watch me or, or go to the website uh one man throw ride.com so throw ride uh obviously thank you for coming on baby what what in the <laughs> hell <Right! Yeah. laughs> Broken Up Podcast is executive produced by Ellen Utrecht, edited by Megan Solano, audio by Dory Bavarsky, and artwork by Neve Bavarsky. Please like, subscribe, follow, stock, DM, love them all. They're amazing. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your rave reviews, your shares, your comments, your spam to your friends, your email blasts, your clubhouse chats about this episode. Thank you so much. We appreciate all the love, the merits, the accolades, the attention, and most importantly, the thumbs up. Talk soon. We're out.